how many of you are members of the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities? Great, thank you. Uh, I do want to start off with that because this is such a big crowd and this is um, the third in this series. I do encourage you all to join the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and I'm going to do a little bit here to tell you why before we start. Forty years ago, this organization was founded to give access to every citizen in this state to their diverse history and culture. We've been working to do that tirelessly ever since under conditions that have been varying, to say the least. Um, due to state funding cuts and federal funding cuts, we need your support more than ever. And so um, www.leh.org is a great place to start for that. Um, I'll get that out of the way. I do want to welcome you all. Um, this center was started six years ago with a mission to provide context to events that are going on in contemporary New Orleans. And by context, um, we mean historical and scholarly research that we think has a bearing on uh, the events of the recent era. Um, before I move forward anymore, um, and in a completely different track, I want to thank Abita Beer and Zab's Chips for making this all easier on everybody. Uh, I also want to take a minute to thank my colleague and partner in this, Denise Faulkner Edwards, who has been excellent the whole way through and made this all work. Um, as I said, our mission has been to open up this history and this culture to everyone in this state. And programs like these, we feel like, are the best way for um, a greater audience to gain some perspective on uh, what is going on around us. And I think that, as we've seen in the last two editions, change is nothing new in New Orleans or Louisiana. And as we look out the window, we can see that change continues. Um, we, though, believe that uh, learning history is not necessarily to allay your concerns about change, but perhaps equips you a little better to do things like vote and make decisions about what's going on around you in this city. For that reason, we took on this project um, to look at who has arrived in New Orleans over the last 300 years. Um, where did they come from? What were their motivations? And what were their impacts on this state? Um, one thing that has a, a severe impact on all of us uh, are cell phones. So if you could, <laughs> please turn those cell phones off now. There's nothing that identifies you as a vampire gentrificator uh, than your cell phone going off during important discussions. So uh, please, please do that for us. Uh, we are joined by a really excellent uh, uh, group, and I do want to look back at the people that helped us out in the previous um, editions. Um, some of them are here tonight. I know Dr. Larry Powell and Dr. Raphael Kazmir are here, and I do want to thank both of them. My previous moderators were Dr. Michael Saitiski and David Johnson, editor of Louisiana Cultural Vistas, and I'd like to thank both of them as well. Um, both of them uh, prefaced things by identifying how they arrived in the city. Neither of them were born here, and I thought it would be um, only right that I would admit that I am an arrival two times blessed. I got here in 1995 to go to school. I left here in 1999, and I returned in October of 06. Uh, so my perspective on this city um, has those bookends and has those missing spots in it. And I always like to preface things by that and, and say that that's definitely the perspective from which I operate. And I think um, all of us have our own origin stories with this city. And part of exploring that is to admit what we don't know. Um, how it's going to work tonight, uh, the four of us are going to talk for about an hour. Uh, we will then turn it over to you all. Um, for some questions. Um, have you on the questions later on the comments if possible. There is a microphone right there for that period. If you could do that, that would be great because we are recording all of this. Um, the first video is already up on our Facebook page and on leh.org. Uh, the second video should be up in the next day or two, and I, this will be up, I'm hoping, in the next 10 days to two weeks. Um, there's also some information on each of your seats that was prepared um, by the Greater New Orleans Data Center. And as much as possible, we like to frame these things with hard facts whenever we can. And I'll try and do that as much as possible as we move through the conversation. But I do think it's um, crucial that when we talk about such important issues like the changes that are going on in the demographics and populations of the city, we try and look back at um, some data and, and use that as a guidestone as much as we can. It was not easy to put together this particular panel because so many people have studied what's going on in the city. So many people have informed our debate. I wrestled with it up until um, last night, really. I almost just completely turned it upside down and invited 10 more people up here. But 
But um, aside from the loss of sleep, I do think that uh, we have with us tonight people that can offer great insight into what is going on. To my far, far right, Katie Rechtal is an award-winning freelance journalist who is a frequent contributor to the New Orleans Advocate. She's been a city desk reporter for Gambit and the Times Pic the daily Times Picayuna, she capitalizes, <laughs> and has written for The Lens, The New York Times, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, Next City, and the Christian Science Monitor. She recently created two reports for the ongoing YES series about the reshaping of the city's criminal justice system and a long-form multimedia piece for the Weather Channel about threatened Gulf Coast communities. Please welcome Katie Rechtal. <laughs> to Katie's left, Rafael Dagadillo is the former programs coordinator for Fuentes New Orleans Inc., a nonprofit organization that serves Latino populations in the New Orleans metro area. Through Puentes, Rafael worked on initiatives of public safety, civic engagement, and inter-ethnic inter trust building. Rafael's family is from the Dominican Republic, and he has lived in the New Orleans area since the age of six. In 2009, he received his master's in history from the University of New Orleans, where his research focused on Hispanics in New Orleans in the late 19th century. Please get up for Mr. Dagadillo. <laughs> and to my right, uh, Dr. Allison Plyer is the executive director of the Greater New Orleans Community Data Center. The data center has been compiling and analyzing demographic data for Greater New Orleans since 1998. Allison is the co-author of the New Orleans Index series, developed in collaboration with the Brookings Institution to analyze the state of the New Orleans recovery and later to track the region's progress towards prosperity. Allison spearheaded the city of New Orleans as challenge to the Census Bureau's 2007 and 2008 population estimate, resulting in a nearly 75,000 person adjustment to the Bureau's estimate of the city's population, ultimately bringing the estimate for New Orleans within 6% of the 2010 census count, which is an amazing feat. Allison received her doctorate in science from Tulane University, has an MBA from the Kellogg Graduate School of Management and Northwestern University, and a BA from Vanderbilt University. Please welcome Dr. Allison Plyer. As I said, each of you should have um, uh, on your seat a uh, presentation that Allison put together for us to sort of um, create a framework for um, recent times. And we are tonight not just starting um, after the storm, but we're going to back it up and talk a little bit more about what happened in the city in the 80s and 90s so that we have a little bit larger perspective of who's been coming here since then and uh, what changes we can really judge um, in the last eight years. So I thought, Allison, maybe first you could uh, walk us through uh, what you've put together. Um. Sure. Um, I was telling Brian, is this working? Yeah, okay, good. I was telling Brian that I was very excited to do this tonight because this is my favorite topic, demographics. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully um, I can make it sort of exciting for you guys too. Um, but um, if, if I could take a, a point of quick personal privilege here and tell you how I came to New Orleans and I don't know if I'll start a trend on the panel, but um, I moved here in, uh, 15 years ago in 1998, and my story, I think, is um, uh, represents some of the aspects I'm going to talk about in the data. I grew up in Chicago um, and uh, went to Vanderbilt undergrad, and then I you know, got some business experience, got my MBA, worked in for-profit consulting for a while, and then I really wanted to do nonprofit work, so I went to Guatemala and I worked with um, women weaving cooperatives down there, and then I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, and I worked with low-income women, helping them start small businesses in a nonprofit there, and that was the mid-90s, right? So it was like the total dot-com boom, and my rent was going through the roof every year. And I was like, okay, the question was, do I stay in San Francisco and um, keep and 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 go back to the for-profit sector because that was the only way I could afford to stay, or do I leave? <clears throat> and I would come to New Orleans, you know, to visit friends that I had met when I was at Vanderbilt. We would go to Jazz Fest, and I th every year I would think this is a great place, New Orleans. I should move to New Orleans, and then I would think, oh, that's ridiculous. You can't just move to New Orleans. And then the year that my rent was getting so expensive I didn't know what I was going to do, I thought, you know, it's not a ridiculous idea. I'm just going to move to New Orleans. So I had no job, and I moved to New Orleans. And some people thought I was a little crazy to move somewhere with no job. But I had friends, right? And so that's the beginning of the story. Because according to the literature, the most frequent reason people move from one place to another is for work opportunities. The secondary reason is social networks. 
And if you think about your own experience, that's why you've moved to different places as well, right? And then the third reason is because they get pushed out for some reason. So if you think about um, Latinos coming to the United States, they come mostly for work opportunities, and they're facilitated by um, social networks. And sometimes they're pushed out of the place where they left. And similarly, when we think about young people coming here, it's for work opportunities, primarily. So. Today, among Americans, the young and the well-educated are the most likely to move long distances. Um, and in contrast, those who are less well-educated and have um, less income among Americans are less likely to move from the literature. But, but we know that um, that's not true of, of, of immigrants coming from elsewhere. They oftentimes are, are not well-educated. So what, this is what you're going to see in this data that I'm going to march you through. Um, so on the first page here, to understand why we have new arrivals at any point in New Orleans, you have to understand how our economy is doing because population grows and shrinks in parallel with jobs. And that's what we see in these trends over the decades. And you're going to take this home and study it because I'm going to go through it real fast. <laughs> So on the next page, what we did was we show you the jobs trends, but um, a little more granular year by year. And here you see the jobs dropping during the oil bust in the 1980s. We lost population during that time frame. Then it's, it recovered through the 1990s. We gained population. We lost population when Katrina hit, um, along with jobs. We were regaining uh, jobs and population, and then the recession hit, and our jobs recovery slowed. However, at the bottom of that page, you'll see that we have done better through the recession in terms of jobs than the rest of the nation. And that's part of why our population continues to grow. So, what kind of jobs? Um, the next one you have to kind of flip a little bit sideways. We're growing mostly knowledge-based industries. <laughs> Um, those are the ones that are doing best during the recession, uh, and that's true across the nation. That's a national uh, phenomena that our whole economy is moving more toward knowledge-based industries. So those are some of the jobs. Again, you're going to study this at home later because I'm going to whip through it. Um, and then on the next page, we also have booming entrepreneurship as I think many of you know. Um, so uh, entrepreneurship has, is something that, that feeds itself to some extent, and it, we've gotten a lot of buzz and national press for our entrepreneurship, and that's going to draw more entrepreneurs. Um, that's a whole other panel we could have sometime, <laughs> but I'll just say that really briefly. So that's certainly a piece of it. Um, and then I want something really important to touch on is the next one where we see employment rates. Now, you all are probably familiar with unemployment rates and may know that unemployment does not take into account those people who are not looking for work. So once you factor in those who are not even looking for work, you get a different picture. Employment rates is the share of the entire working age population that has employment. And what you see on the left are declining employment rates for men all across the nation over the last four decades. This is because we've reduced manufacturing jobs, reduced uh, uh, construction jobs in the most recent decade, whereas you see increasing employment rates for women over the last four decades. It's because we have growth in healthcare, education, but obviously also availability of childcare, uh, birth control, other factors, right, that, that, um, that increase women's um, labor force participation. So, but the trick here is if you look at New Orleans, white males and black males compared to some other geographies. And what we see is that um, in the middle row, white males currently are, have 75% employment rates in the New Orleans metro. And that's very similar to fast growing southern metros, um, which we called our aspirational metros in the New Orleans index um, that you can look up in the other handout. So, so you can see we're doing well, the white men are doing well, just like other southern metros, um, and better than these weak city metros, which are post-industrial Rust Belt kind of metros, right? And that's what we want. We want to be better than the Rust Belt cities um, that we used to be sort of more like. But black men are not, right? And so what we see is 53% of black men have employment here, and that's on par with those post-industrial metros and lower than the other aspirational southern metros. So, so we are having um, some economic boom, but it is not benefiting everyone. And that's what we see in the data. So... Um, the the uh, population and jobs uh, grows and decline together at the metro level, right? Um, but within the city, um, you can have some counter trends, and that's because it depends on who the city attracts, 
right? The pie grows and shrinks at the metro area level, but the city attracts certain folks. Um, and so, so what we see from the city's population is it is, of course, smaller than it was at its peak in the 1960s, um, but these are just uh, once every 10 year counts, right? So if you're looking at 2000 to 2010, there at the very end of that blue graph, it looks like a big downward slant, right? But we know what happened in the middle there is it went vroom, right? And then it zoomed back up. So what we have at the bottom of the page are some data we look at to track on a regular basis um, population and its households receiving mail. And that continues to increase, right? So, we're, so we know that now our population is higher than it was in 2010 and it's continuing to grow. And um, that's because our economy is doing better than the rest of the nation. We have better options here um, than much of the nation. I know you guys are going to study this at home, right? Because I'm going really fast. <laughs> yeah, there will be. That's right. So, you... <laughs> so uh, again, if you want to understand the changing demographics in our region, it's really important to understand the suburbs. Um, it used to be that uh, the suburbs were um, only about a third of the metro's population. Now they're two-thirds of the population. Um, so they make up a big, big portion of our um, demographic pie. And the other thing is it's important to understand national trends. The, so the really fun thing in my world of demography is that we have this saying. It's called, demography is destiny. It sounds sort of like... Did you copyright that? Did that <laughs> I did not. Some other demographer <laughs> came up with that. It sounds really sort of, you know, sinister. But what... It, this is what's displayed in this graphic here, the one that, with the green tones. So... Um, what this shows is the age breakdown of, the na of our national population by race and ethnicity, right? And so if you look at those um, age groups over 60, they are largely white, right? And if you look below 60 and even to the younger children, more and more diverse, right? And more uh, people of color whether black, Latino, et cetera. So what we know, and this, everybody knows this, every, every year each of us gets one year older, Unless there's only one other option, right? Some years, it feels like many years. <laughs> right. So you, what you can do is look at these trends and say, okay, in five years, each of these bars just moves up a rank, right? And then some folks die. So if we factor in age-specific death rates, we can see what the population is going to look like in five years, and the next five years, and the next five years, and the next five years. And that's assuming no net in-migration. If we have in-migration, it will become more diverse because we know that the, the um, regions around the world that have the highest population growth are those regions that have people of color. So we are going to be an increasingly diverse nation, um, and there's, unless we start importing Martians, which I suppose would also make us very, very diverse as well. <laughs> so um, another way to look at that is on the next page, um, groups can, can do these actual projections and see that the nation um, will be majority-minority by 2043. Um, and that does factor in some in-migration. And then on the next page, which is green, we see those same... Um, types of projections just for our metro. And so what you see here is that, um, and you guys are doing a great job of keeping up. I'm so impressed. Um, what you see here is that obviously during the Katrina era, we lost a large uh, chunk of our African-American population in the metro, but the Latino population, take a look at that, really spiked. And the Asian population also grew. So overall, we actually increased the share of our population that was non-white in that decade, despite the loss of African Americans. And then you can see that it's going to continue to grow, right? Um, and that's just the nature of our demographics locally and nationally. So we will be, as a, as a metro, majority minority by 2030, faster than the nation. Um, and so just breaking down a couple of those groups, um, and this um, um, might help Rafael a little bit when he, we get to that point. Um, on the next page, you can see where the Latinos were and are, um, where the spikes have been, particularly Jefferson Parish. But every single parish has seen a growth in the number of Latinos um, from, since the year 2000. And then, of course, our most predominant um, Asian group is Vietnamese. Um, and it was largely um, centered in um, Orleans and Jefferson with some um, 
uh, concentrations in some of the other parishes too, and then you can see how there's been some shifting as folks have moved away from the more damaged parishes, right, like Orleans and uh, Plaquemines. Um, okay, so now moving on to aging. <laughs> Wait, you, when you gave me the proposal in its original form, there was uh, three slides titled the baby boomers are a tidal wave. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought, I hope we get to. There they are. There it is. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you've got it on the back or something. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, the baby boomers are like a demographic tidal wave, right? So, there you see them in 1970. Anybody relate to that year? I was in that cohort, too. I was about nine, I think, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> I know, some of you are a little farther along, aren't you? But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so fast forward to 2000 and there, I was around 40, right? And then uh, fast forward, and now I'm, okay, letting you know that I'm around 50. But some of y'all are getting up to 65, aren't you? <laughs> and so, so we can very predictably project exactly what, how many um, folks we will have over 65 in um, the next uh, 20 years. Because just by aging all those folks forward and factoring in some age-specific death rates, you can see there's going to be an increase of 100,000 people over 65 in our metro. Um, so that is going to have a major impact. Those are the same trends we're seeing across the nation. Those are the same trends we're seeing in many countries, including China. So... Um, so this is a factor across the world in, in many places. Um, so what that does, it, it, that, and if you look now at the next page, I guess you're keeping up, aren't you? You're doing good. <laughs> um, what that means is that our household structures are changing. Now, this is something I think really useful to sort of try to process, right? We have a lot fewer households with children not just here, but across the nation. And that's um, partly because of the aging of the baby boomers, partly because um, lower birth rates. You have fewer people having children in general. Um, and you have a rapid rise in the number of people living alone. Now, when we talk about people living alone, everybody thinks, oh, that's young professionals or elderly. And if you look at the slide down below, what you realize that it is defies stereotypes. It is everybody of every age group. It has to do with divorce rates. It has to do with a number of confounding factors. So when you have a lot, when you have these kind of changing demographics, so when people say, oh, you know, my neighborhood has changed so much, there's not so many families with children. There just aren't so many families with children anymore. So it's not going to be like it was on my block when I was growing up where every single household was giving out candy at Halloween. That's just not the way it is, right? So these are some of the changing demographics we'll see everywhere. And then the, um, the last thing, a couple things I'll point out is um, that educational attainment is increasing across our nation. More and more people are getting bachelor's degrees. Um, we desperately need them to do that, so that's good. Um, we, of course, have more people here with bachelor's degrees than we did 10 years ago, but um, our increases are not as fast as the nation's. So um, that's a challenge we have. Some of these national trends uh, oftentimes are more pronounced in the city. Um, so if you look at the bottom of almost the last page, you'll see that the share of people with a bachelor's degree in Orleans is highest. Than, than other parts of the metro, right? You have lesser concentrations of people with a bachelor's degree in Jefferson, St. Tammany, et cetera. Um, so you tend to have concentrated um, folks of higher education here in the city. Um, you also have more folks um, without children in the city. Um, but as you notice, uh, households with children are dropping across the uh, suburbs as well. There are just fewer households with children period. Um, and that's just in a 10-year span. Um, and then um, the number of one-person households are increasing, um, even in the suburbs. Uh, and so, but most pronounced here in the city. So, 
All that is the context. So when the city is thinking about who is it we're going to attract, well, mostly what we're going to be able to attract is who is on the planet, right? Like it can't be somebody other than that. So these trends really influence um, the kinds of folks who could um, be in the city and who those new arrivals could be. Um, so a lot of people, this is one of the, the very last slide here is the best data we have on who these new arrivals are post-Katrina. Everybody asks me this all the time. So who are all these new people and how many people are still displaced? And the truth of the matter is nobody knows the answer to that question because there's no data set that tracks that sort of thing. We don't have chips in the back of our neck that help us all know exactly who's where, right? But we do know only um, how many people have answered a survey saying that they came here in the most recent year. So some of those people are returnees and some of those people are brand, brand new. Um, but regardless, they're going to be shaped by some of those national trends. Um, so they're less likely to be families with children. Um, they're uh, more likely to be minorities. Um, and um, they're more likely to be individuals living alone. It's not like they're going to be entirely any one of those things. But those national trends are very much going to influence um, who is living in our city and our region and who will in the future. So um, that's the data. That is the data, and it's quite a <laughs> bit of data. Um, <clears throat> and I think it brings it up, us right up to the present. I do want to maybe take a step back and ask you just a quick question, and, and, and this almost is another set of data, but in, in looking at the last 25 years, and, and really uh, even since the post-World War II era, when we look at New Orleans um, as a city that went through, um, you know, large issues with desegregation, with white flight, um, with uh, crime, with the defunding of cities that went on under Republican uh, administrations around, you know, from the 80s onward. When we look at it economically, how much of what we see over this, this arc that I'm talking about, and that takes us almost up to the, to, the, to the storm itself, to the failure of the levees, how much is New Orleans' story similar to other cities? And, and thus, is it a tar is it perhaps attracting similar people or sending similar people away? Yeah, you, that was a great question because, um, you know, over the last several decades, the policies that shaped New Orleans are very, very similar to what shaped lots of other cities, right? So um, white flight facilitated by the d development of highways, right, and also people's preferences for sort of suburban-style living um, uh, when they when they could uh, access that. Of course, there was redlining that kept some uh, folks, uh, particularly African-Americans, out of certain um, suburbs. But, but oftentimes, even within the city, we have all um, different report on this, people move from, um, you know, uh, near the river in Central City and to uh, more suburban style living in places like New Orleans East because of preferences for suburban style living, but the but the um, but the the highways facilitated all that. And then um, even before Katrina, there started to be um, and, and I'll, I'll back up and say all those trends were present in really almost every city nationwide, any large city, um, uh, because they were federal policies. Um, and then uh, even pre-Katrina, there started to be sort of um, new policies, and some of that supported the the, um, the growth of sort of downtown living, right? So th the warehouse district started to be redeveloped for, um, you know, condos and residences long before Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, and so those trends were in place, too, and we can see that in the data that, that downtown living was starting to, to get built up. Um, before Katrina. And in a way, what Katrina did was really accelerate all of those trends. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, literally fast forward the federal policies of closing down and redeveloping housing projects. Um, and in other cases, um, just uh, uh, more people ending, ending up getting displaced to the suburbs um, who we already we already were seeing um, people moving out to the suburbs pre-Katrina, which again, we saw that uh, in other cities as well, um, whether rich or poor. So, so yeah, in short, um, what was happening here was really very similar to what was happening in other um, metros and regions, and um, Katrina really accelerated it. And I ask that not so much to um, downplay our exceptionalism, but rather I think throughout this conversation, Looking at what external factors drove people to the city is also something that we should think about, and uh, what's going on in the rest of the country obviously impacts the city. I think that should be, you know, part of our conversations we go through. Um, Raphael, you and I had spoken a little bit on the phone last night, and, and again we had talked about sort of 
widening our scope some back into you know the 80s and the 1990s and, and to get that perspective from a standpoint of Latino population during that period and not to think of them as homogenous at all either who was coming and why were they coming in that period can everybody hear me all right um well uh, if I could just backtrack a little bit just so folks uh, know where I'm coming from I'm you know, being a, this is the Arrival series, I'm a little bit like Allison, where I was not born in New Orleans, but I've been here since I was six years old. Um, my family moved here from the Dominican Republic. I like to say that I'm a native-born immigrant because I was born in New York. My joke is like most Dominicans, I was born in New York. <laughs> and and uh, when I was about six months old, we moved to the DR, to the Dominican Republic, and when I was six years old, we moved here to New Orleans. And, uh, you know, so I've lived here all my life, but I've also got the experience of an immigrant. I didn't speak English when I first got here. I learned it uh, right here at St. Anthony of Padua on Canal Street. And, um, and one thing I always like to say is when we first got here, my dad, you know, we were walking around the French Quarter and, you know, people talk about New Orleans being this Northern Caribbean place and my dad's walking around and he says, where are we? <laughs> you know, because this looks like Santiago de los Caballeros in the Dominican Republic, you know, and, uh, you know, that really sparked my, uh, my interest in the history of the city and, and just what it was. And, and uh, um, just want to say that, you know, when we think about New Orleans, you know, um, a lot of us at the University of New Orleans, a lot of the graduate students, you know, we like to try to change the paradigm of how we think about New Orleans. Because to us, a lot of people in the department, we think of New Orleans as a city in Latin America um, because of its culture, <laughs> because of its uh, foundations, you know. Um, and I say that because, um, you know, there's almost this uh, myth about the Hispanic population in New Orleans as if we just popped out of the ground after Katrina. <laughs> And uh, before Katrina, you know, we would often think of ourselves as being invisible. And, uh, and after doing, you know, some research at UNO and also just living here, um, you know, I found out that it was a lot more than that. And so as I speak tonight, I'm going to speak as, you know, um, through my knowledge that I got through doing research at UNO, uh, through my experience of working at Puentes, one of the first um, nonprofit organizations found in the city. Um, one of the founders is here, uh, Martin Gutierrez. And... Um, you know, uh, one of the, they were founded in 2007 to do community development, community organizing, and I worked for them for five years. Uh, but also, I'm going to be reflecting on my experience as a Hispanic person here. Um, now, we moved here in, in the 80s, so we're part of this wave that you're talking about. And uh, my father was a salesman. Um, you know, he worked at uh, stores on Canal Street selling, um, you know, selling electronics and things like that, mostly to tourists. Um, and he did well, he did well doing that. But that's not where most Hispanics, and I'm going to use the terms Hispanic and Latino interchangeably. Um, if you want to know what, what I think about the differences are, we can talk about that later, but I'm going to use them interchangeably here. Um, and uh, well, what I found is that, uh, you know, most Hispanics uh, gravitate towards the service industry. You'll see them in hotels. You'll see them at restaurants. Um, the, the Dominicans that, that live here, uh, mostly on the West Bank, um, uh, they tend to work in the oil refineries also in the service industry, but oil refineries is really what attracted um, them here. That started in the 70s. Um, and obviously, since Katrina, we've had a, a boom, obviously, in construction, and that's where we've seen um, a lot of Hispanics come from, especially from Central America and Mexico. Um, now, with that being said, it has to be understood. Hondurans have had a very long and strong connection to New Orleans for a very long time. You know, United Fruit Company was headquartered in New Orleans, and they virtually owned Honduras, as we know. And that really started um, the immigration uh, going about late 1880s, 1890s um, through the fruit trade. Um, and so, but that's, uh, you know, that part of the history is largely forgotten. You know, we've, um, we, a lot of those folks in a way got mixed in with, uh, uh, with populations that were already here, uh, especially in the downtown areas, the Creole populations, um, because of the Catholicism and, you know, French and Spanish being spoken widely there. Um, but then we do have, um, you know, the traces of that community in a way, I, I don't want to say it's been lost, but it has been forgotten. What we do have now is a modern community that really started after the 1965 Immigration Act um, that lifted the quotas on how many immigrants could come from Latin America. And, uh, and those folks have been coming in steadily since the 60s. Um, peaked, I think, in the 70s and 80s, if you look at the data. And uh, again, got into those industries, service industry, oil refinery, um, you know, all those uh, things. And they really settled all over the city. And if you look at the handout that I've passed out, it shows you um, the settlement patterns 
from the census is taken from the year 2000 at the bottom, the year 2010. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, that's one thing that, um, that we've always dealt with um, in New Orleans is that there's really no centrality when it comes to uh, the Hispanic population here. Um, there is no real Hispanic community. What I always say is that there's a network of communities because there's, uh, what you find in New Orleans is that every Latin American nation has a community here. It's represented. There's Dominicans, Mexicans, Peruvians, Hondurans, who have traditionally been the majority, if not the plurality of Hispanics. I have no Argentines, Uruguayans, Brazilians, any country, you name it, they're here. It's just in small pockets, as you can see by the, um, by the map. Um, there are some strong pockets of, of settlement, as you can see, Kenner, Metairie, uh, mostly Mexican, Central Americans. Um, the West Bank is everybody. That's where most of the Dominican population lives. And in Mid-City, New Orleans East, um, where you'll find, again, a lot of Central Americans, a lot of Hondurans and Mexicans. Um, and those are the, uh, like I said, the industries that they got into were, uh, you know, service industry, uh, oil and gas, and, um, and pretty much all over. Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> What was the, I'm sorry, but I got a little lost there. No, I, <laughs> yeah, I was right with you. Um, I think that I, I would almost ask the same question as I, as I followed up with Allison is um, this period of immigration you're talking about is this is a sort of a normal arc that's going on in New Orleans as it might be going on in other cities in the South. Right, right. Um, yeah, uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, they, they it's, 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 it's like everything in life, it's complicated. Because, um, like I said, the folks started settling here, and you know, um, there wasn't really, um, like I said, with no centrality came no political clout, no political power. There was no organization because we're so scattered. We're not a, you know, we've been racialized because we were here in New Orleans, in the United States, where Hispanic were Latino, because of the black and white paradigm. Um, but you know, you really can't box us into a group like that. And so um, you don't really have the white, you know, there's no Hispanic community that's lurching, waiting to take over or anything. Um, we're really still getting our bearings under us. We're still um, getting settled and integrating. And, uh, and a lot of folks really never seem to notice until 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit. Now, one thing that I always like to point out is, uh, you know, all of a sudden the attention's on all the day laborers that showed up. Um, and there's a very specific reason for that. Um, when Hurricane Katrina hit, President Bush suspended the Bacon Davis Act, which uh, regulated how much you know um, how much uh, construction workers and uh, were to be paid, and because he lifted that, also lifted um, you know uh, uh, you know figuring out if someone was documented or not, and basically contractors were able to hire whoever they wanted, and a lot of the time that was you know day laborers from Central America, Hispanics that were in other parts of the country, and uh, and. That's where the, the new boom is. And, and as you can see from the data that, um, that Allison's uh, shared with us, the population's bigger than it's ever been, uh, where larger percentage-wise and in numbers. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a complicated uh, journey, but you've had um, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of community organizing, a lot of um, organizations like Puentes New Orleans, like the uh, Congress of Day Laborers, who works with day laborers uh, around town, um, that have come up to really um, represent the population and, uh, and advocate for them. Katie, you've done uh, really, I think, fundamentally important work on uh, both cultural issues in the city and also on issues of housing. And again, to sort of frame things by stepping back a few years, I wonder if you could first maybe talk a little bit about some of the policy issues that were going on um, when it comes to housing that we might now see consequences of or parallels with or even contrasts with that can sort of help us to understand you know, what new populations are coming in, but maybe who also is leaving and being displaced. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a handout. I'm the only panelist that doesn't You've done have more than enough writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I also have a sniffle, so I have a double deficit tonight. But, but um, I think the, that with different in-depth stories, if I work on a story for a while, there's usually some kind of policy that led up to it, um, and I feel like once we get, I feel like I've illustrated uh, Allison's stories anecdotally, like I don't know how many different times. So, you know, trying to find the the, the census block that had one person in it, that kind of thing. Um, 
the most emptied census blocks has after New Orleans. But one of the things that I think um, I found out after New Orleans that made more sense to me was um, when we were doing the big stories about sort of the big four being knocked down in public housing, um, I started hearing about these other subsidized apartments and they were in New Orleans East and there were lots of them. And they were something else called project-based apartments. And they had, they had the same kind of rents that public housing apartments did here, which were really very affordable for people making minimum, minimum wages. But they were, um, they were set up a little differently. They were through a HUD program that allowed, um, that subsidized construction in exchange for the owners um, signing on for a certain amount of years, usually about 20 or 30, I think, um, that they had to, to provide... Um, low rents to tenants and that HUD would have these, um, HUD would help subsidize the rents at the apartment buildings. And so, so a lot of the arguments in the, that came up after the storm in the East about these sprawling apartment complexes that were not kept up very well, um, or places where there was a lot of, um, concentration of poverty, that was housing policy that created that. And it wasn't just some sort of, um, New Orleans East gone wild sort of moment. That was actually HUD policy that created that. And the reason why it happened in the East was that when those policies went into place, New Orleans East was a place that had land for people to build. So those kinds of things I think are interesting to look back on. Um, and even, like looking at um, doing stories about the desegregation of schools here and when Ruby Bridges walked into the school in France in the um, Upper Ninth Ward, knowing that the housing project, the Florida, the white housing project that was nearby was mostly, um, according to accounts at the time, was rural whites who'd come into the uh, city seeking work. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that... Um, those schools down in that area were considered sort of in poor neighborhoods and they were chosen as a place for, to desegregate schools and it ended up in such a conflagration that, you know, that the, uh, Robert Kennedy said, we don't want another New Orleans, right? It was such a horrible situation. So there are certain things that you can see. Um, it, it, you can see that people who are trying to seek better situations for their kids and then have have something tumultuous happen in their neighborhood would react more than somebody who had more of a stable housing situation. So I think housing has played a role in some of those historic moments. And we had also talked a little bit before this um, on a different track about sort of the cultural appeal of New Orleans and the culture that was here prior to the storm and what role it sort of played, maybe in attracting people and, and how even at that point, you had people starting to come to New Orleans because more and more it had this image of a place where one was allowed to go and embrace you know, a, a culture that was unlike anywhere else. Can you talk a little bit just from your own experiences about how that looked and maybe what kind of impact that had as, as the city? And as we see in some of the data that Allison's presented, um, tourism, for instance, was peaking already you know, but in the, between 2000, 1998 maybe and 2004. And to me, that always has something to do with, um, with attracting people from the outside as well. So it's a little bit of a general question, but I think that if you maybe could switch gears and talk just how the culture in, in some of the uh, wards has been affected by um, people even before the wave that we've seen recently. Well, I think um, we talked a little bit earlier about how when I first moved here, and I moved here in 99, so I didn't want to be in a New Orleans without an Allison Plyer, so I moved to... <laughs> The year after you, um, and and by the way, I do remember before that you started the data center, and when you did, how refreshing it was to have these things that I would sort of grasp onto as this must be a trend. There must be some data somewhere, and then there wouldn't be. And suddenly, Allison and you guys, when the data center opened, it was an amazing resource to be able to look at trends, especially for low-income people. That was an unheard of resource. So it's been really wonderful to have. Um, I mean, this much research at your fingertips has been amazing. Um, but when I first moved here, I remember um, I, um, I started working for American Roots, the Nick Spitzer mm -hmm. public radio show. I came here for a year and ended up staying longer. Um, and 
I, so I, because Nick was doing programming about the culture of New Orleans, I, I mean, I remember meeting a big chief and not understanding what that meant and um, thinking it was kind of quaint. He called him big chief and stuff. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, and so I re recall going, being dragged along on different processions to the neighborhoods for different things. And, um, there were, um, it's been a long tradition, especially if a musician dies to every night before, uh, every night until the musician goes in the grave from when he dies until he goes into the grave, you parade for him. And, um, and before the storm, I would say that almost... Every time uh, that one of those bands went out, during that week, there would be, at some point, the police would come and break that up. And, and sometimes um, they would arrest people. They'd put musicians up against the wall. They'd say, anybody with an instrument's going to be arrested. It was, it was pretty common. And it wasn't really, um, I had written about it. It didn't really feel like it had raised any, it raised some, some people's, um, uh, concerns, but it, I felt like after the storm, when a very similar thing happened, um, there was a funeral pre procession for Kerwin James, a tuba player for Newbirth, who, um, who died, and suddenly it became an enormous issue in that it really has created a different sense of this, we're not going to do this anymore um, by the police department. And so, but I, it was very routine before the storm for that to happen, and for Mardi Gras Indians as well, um, on St. Joseph's night, for sure, you were going to have the cops shake you down at some point, tell you to go home, take your fucking feathers off, that kind of thing. That was so routine. Pardon my language. That was, um, um, that was very common. And so I think the one thing that has changed since I've been here is there's been some sort of sense that, that we don't want this to happen anymore. And that's a, that's a very different sensibility. Do you think that's informed by um, sort of a larger audience, perhaps, that's going to those things? Yeah, maybe. And I just think also that after the storm, people re realized what was precious about New Orleans. I mean, you know, I, w I want to ask, wasn't New Orleans the, the place in the nation that had the highest number of Native-born people? Wasn't that, wasn't that the, the, the statistic that we yeah. threw around before the storm? Right? Yeah. Because I remember working with an intern about a story about that New Orleans was not a gateway city, right? Mm -hmm. um, right before the storm and, and one of the only ones that wasn't really attracting new people. Um, and so, I mean, I think that, that suddenly those native born traditions became really important when you landed in a city where you couldn't find everything that you liked, right? It mm -hmm. became a lot more important. I want to take it, um, to around the period, um, of the levee failure and maybe Allison, you can just sort of, paint a picture for us of, of what happened demographically and, and economically at that period. And obviously we can see by the data and we all know from personal experience the, the great drop. But what was the city facing as far as population loss and as far as, as far as an economic hit at that point? And I know that's a hard thing to put in perspective, but maybe if we can start right there. Mm. Um, it's always fun to think about, isn't it, that moment? <laughs> um, for those of us who are here. Um, but, uh, you know, um, at the time, uh, obviously I was evacuated too, and we started working with the Brookings Institution, and um, it was quickly apparent that, you know, the, what would save the city was jobs, um, and that people would come back if there were jobs. And um, that ultimately, and that's still the case now, that, you know, people might get a house um, in the Brad Pitt zone of the Lower Ninth Ward, but if they can't find a job, they can't necessarily come back. And I've, I've known some folks like that. So, so the long and short is that, that because the central business district was spared largely, um, that meant a lot. And so the residential um, parts of the city, of course, which were vast and um, uh, incredibly damaged, and, and all the businesses in those residential areas, of course, were destroyed. But because there was some ability still for the, um, the central business district to function uh, m meant that there were going to be a locus of jobs um, that would attract people in addition to obviously the rebuilding, right? But the rebuilding is sort of an artificial stimulus that happens and is temporary. Um, so just demographically, of, of course, the first people who um, were able to come back were people, um, you know, who had 
jobs and that were better paying jobs. You may recall that um, the Popeyes and the McDonald's were all offering signing right, bonuses, right. right? You can make like 30 grand a year working for Burger King. Because, um, because the housing stock was um, decimated and we had just a sliver of the housing left and so the rents on the available housing stock went through the roof and so what was uh, available no longer was affordable for um, people you know, working at McDonald's by any means. And so those people were, so demographically what we saw in the trends was um, the people who were the first to come back were the people of means. Of course, those tended to be people um, who were white um, primarily. Uh, and um, the people who had the hardest time co coming back were the poorest people. And obviously that the poor, the very, very poorest people lived in the housing projects um, mostly, not entirely. We have actually large, large parts of the city which have poor populations and not just the housing projects. But so the housing projects were just a piece of it, right, in terms of keeping people, um, low-income people from coming back, but it was really more that in general housing had became so expensive post-Katrina. So um, so the, the tourism industry started trying to figure out ways to um, do more with less. They couldn't get um, as many folks to fill the jobs that they had, and so they were finding ways to be more efficient in the kitchen even um, because literally because the most of the housing that had housed people in that industry was destroyed. Um, so and then, um, you know, the Latinos being this great exception, right, where um, where they, they come into situations like um, ours, but also lots of other cities and and live, you know, lots of folks in 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 overcrowded settings and, um, you know, pulling all their resources together. So um, could sort of tolerate those um, conditions of, of of low wages with uh, with unaffordable rents, not tolerate them well by any means. I wouldn't say that, but but yeah. So in the beginning, uh, the first people who came back were the people who had more means, and um, it, the heart, the people who had the hardest time coming back were those with less means. And ultimately, even if you had means, um, unless you were independently wealthy, if you if your job was eliminated you probably turned right around and left again, as many who were employed at Tulane and, and Loyola noticed. Um, so, um, so again, you know, emphasizing that um, jobs being a critical factor in what makes people move from one place to another. And obviously, one of the jobs was construction, and it, it, originally it was construction on a very, you know, clean out mold, rip things out level. Raphael, how does it, how does it usually work, or how, what, what, what were the reports at the time? When something like this happens, and then, you know, within months we see day laborers, and for a couple of years there, that was just a, something you saw. Actually, the Home Depot, they're closing on Carrollton. I just drove out there the other day, and I thought, wow, th this was a constant presence here, and, and, and suddenly it's gone. But take us sort of back to that period when, you know, what were the numbers, and how... What's the network that goes on that that, that, uh, that people know there are jobs there? I mean, I assume it's as much mainstream media as anything else, but how people sort of mobilize in order to come to New Orleans or to any spot that has an opening for that kind of work? Um, well, the, um, with the numbers, that's something that we'll probably never know. Mm -hmm. um, we really hit a, a peak right after the storm for a couple of years. Um, I, I know people that, did, that worked directly with day laborers, and if you went to uh, Lee Circle, I mean you would literally see hundreds of day laborers and they, they would all get work at the time. Um, also, you saw them pop up at the uh, at, at different corners around the city, uptown, uh, Gentilly, at the Lowe's and Home Depots that, that popped open. And uh, a lot of those folks did not live in New Orleans before the hurricane. They came afterwards, they were, you know, um, they were enticed to come here by the work, they knew that it was gonna come. Um, and again, like, like I said, when President Bush, uh, you know, uh, suspended the uh, Bacon Davis Act, it really gave um, contractors impetus to, to recruit these day laborers. Um, and when they got here, what they found was work, which they were very happy with. But, uh, you know, there were a lot of um, negative impacts, too. Um, one of the first ones was housing. A lot of times these guys were, um, were living in the houses they were fixing. Um, or they'd be fixing several houses at once and living in one, um, going from place to place. I mean, these guys weren't just working in one area of the city. They were working all over town. They would get brought from one, from one part of the, of the city to another to work on different houses depending on the contractor. Um, uh, then, but with that arose a lot of problems. A lot of these folks were undocumented. And so, you know, there is a... Um, 
you know, there's a, you know, when it comes to the, the rhetoric and the dialogue around this issue, you know, a lot of people <laughs> seem to forget that, you know, it's not a comfortable life to be an undocumented immigrant. Um, and the housing became one of the first issues. The second issue is being underpaid or stiffed completely from being paid because when they would go to collect their money, they'd get nothing. And the contractors would threaten them um, uh, by saying they would report them to ICE. You know, they just hired mm -hmm. these folks to fix something. And then after that, they would threaten to call ICE on these people. Um, and that became a real issue. Um, and it really mobilized a lot of folks. Like I said, um, you know, I wish Jacinta Gonzalez from the uh, Congress of Day Laborers is here because she could talk mm -hmm. extensively about that. Um, but, uh, you know, they did a lot of organizing, you know, put a lot of pressure on, on, on the, um, you know, the, uh, the deadbeat contractors that weren't paying them. They were working, um, you know, in hazardous conditions. They weren't given equipment. A lot of times these guys were doing construction without helmets, without proper equipment. Um, and uh, one of the other issues that we had um, well, that I've mentioned uh, is, is not being paid, and that's where the Loyola Law Clinic came in. Mm -hmm. And they started working with these folks and representing them and going after the contractors to try to get them some money. A lot of times it wouldn't work. And you would have guys that were owed thousands of dollars that had spent weeks here that simply just did not get paid for their labor. Um, and so that became a real issue. Um, we also had, uh, you know, just a lot of, um, you know, just a lot of, uh, underhanded policies or just upfront racism that we dealt with. Uh, you see what happened in St. Bernard where they passed a law saying you could only rent to a blood relative. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, so again, these f folks are down there fixing the houses, but you have to be related to someone from St. Bernard Parish in order to live in there. Um, uh, also, you know, you had Jefferson Parish ban the food trucks. Um, which, yeah, and you know, I, which Orleans has done a great job of inviting those folks here. Um, and so there were a lot of issues faced by that new community because mm -hmm. a lot of those folks were not here before Katrina. A lot of them were, but most weren't. And um, there were many challenges that those folks were facing that, uh, honestly, a lot of us before the storm didn't deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really galvanized people. It, it, it really um, put the community on edge um, because... You know, uh, it, it, we were being targeted is how it felt. Um, there was also the issue of, uh, I'm sure all of you remember the term walking ATMs. A lot of these folks, because they weren't documented, couldn't get a, a bank account, so they were paid in cash. And it was only a matter of time before a lot of people with bad intentions found out. And if you recall in those early years, 2005 to 2008, it was, no, you know, it was pretty regular that you'd see that, uh, you know, day laborers were being assaulted, even killed for, uh, for um, you know, for their cash. You know, um, and in some neighborhoods, some folks were waiting around for them to come back home because they knew um, when payday was. And uh, those are some of the real life issues that, that were being faced here. And, and we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of people that were here. The number will never be known. I can tell you, if you look around the city, if you drive around, you know, they closed down the Home Depot. Um, so you won't see day laborers there. Um, the numbers have dwindled. You no longer see hundreds of people at a site. You might see 30 to 40 at the most. Um, but yeah, those are some of the issues that, mm -hmm. that folks were dealing with right in the aftermath. I, uh, I was going back to do some research um, around 2007, actually. This is July 2007, um, and I found two interesting headlines in what was then the only newspaper in town. Uh, <laughs> one was um, uh, Oliver Thomas saying, how do the tacos help the gumbo? Right. And uh, within the same week, uh, there was an article about uh, New Orleans as a beacon for young people and this idea that um, young urban rebuilding professionals, Yerps, were here to um, have an opportunity to, to reshape the city. I know that you kind of it sometimes had a foot in, in both of those, mm -hmm. um, in both of those things. Why that contrast? I mean, and how that contrast play out? How did the Latino community maybe receive that kind of contradiction that on the one hand there was a glorious story going on about this city on the other hand there are people that are obviously working to rebuild this city on the ground level and receiving you know political pressure as you said criminal pressure mm -hmm. um to maybe not be here or to not be welcomed the contrast i i mean from what i believe to be the perspective of of the folks that were you know the day laborers and the hispanics that were here is they, they Speak a little closer to the mic oh i'm sorry um you know, as far as contrast, when you, uh, what I perceive is that a lot of the Hispanics simply, I mean, they weren't in that world. And they were just worried about being here, working, and surviving. Um, and, you know, you can go around now and, you know, 
you know, the business incubators and, you know, the idea villages and all these great things that are happening, they're not as relevant to Hispanics as you would think. Um, because we're not, we're not knowledge, you know, we're, we're not involved in knowledge-based industries mm -hmm. like that. We, we're doing construction, um, and things like that. And so it's, it, it's a, not only is it a contrast, it's, there's a real stark division there where a, a lot of folks, um, just not that they're not interested, they're just not exposed to it. And, um, you know, and, and it's interesting to see that because you couldn't have rebuilt the city without the construction. Uh, but the folks that are getting the, the highlight are the folks that are right here at this, in this room. We're the ones that get the attention. You know, we're the ones that that um, you know that get called upon to uh, you know to to receive the um, the adulation and and the uh, you know and and the attention. Mm -hmm. But uh, those folks are just sitting at home worrying about where, where they're going to eat and where the next paycheck is coming from. I feel like I've thrown the uh, at least part of the gorilla of gentrification out there by mentioning young professionals, <laughs> and I I, I want to try and work through it as, as steadily as we can. Um, but Katie, as someone who is, has reported on street culture and, and someone who moved here in 1999 and has seen the city change that way, as you were hearing those narratives, even in media outlets that you were at the time working for, about, um, you know, about who was here and, and, and what their role was to play um, in, in the rebuilding of the city, um, what were your thoughts? How, and and what, how did you see it playing out in some of the communities you're reporting on? Um, well, first of all, I did, you know, I think Jacinta, some one of the things that Jacinta has done at the Congresso that is even that she has in recent cases found out that NOPD was calling border patrol as translators at the time. I mean, that there were, that there were some very, uh, that there was some harsh treatment that was just unnecessary, um, even by, uh, even by post Katrina standards. Right. Um, and also I, I, I know that one of the, one of the things that I had reported on for a while was covering um, some school rebuilding things that were going on. Largely, it was first um, to look at why the schools weren't being rebuilt, right? Because there were all these, there were three schools open or something, and the kids were freaking out because it when it, there were all these people coming back that we didn't expect. We didn't expect people, people especially poor people, to come back, right? How are we going to have public schools be open? And um, so Paul Pastrak had a big initiative to get all these schools rolling, right? But um, he didn't, even though it was federal rebuilding money, it didn't have to have the Davis-Bacon. It was under all of the, um, everything says Davis-Bacon in, in, um, in the law, but apparently there's some little disaster clause. I talked to like one of the top, Davis Bacon lawyers in D.C. or something who said there's a weird little disaster clause and Pastor X an anti-union lawyer and he knew about this. And so when the schools were being rebuilt, we didn't use, uh, we didn't um, use local labor and pay decent wages to do all that school construction. I think it's, it's like, you know, one of the shames of rebuilding because we were hauling in people from Texas in trucks and doing all the things that you're talking about, right? Um, to pay the lowest wages. Um, but so what some of the changes that I had seen involve those kinds of issues, right? Um, I, th I think one of the pieces of the post-storm shortage and the, I think, very brief moment of bonuses at McDonald's and Wendy's, right, that that... Um, that was a pretty abbreviated moment. The thirty thousand dollars a year <laughs> added, maybe yeah. as you know, I don't think it was even going on like within two months or something. It was a pretty it was short right when I, I got golden a job. moment, yeah, that's what I right? That. Right before I got um, a job. But I think it was a moment when employers realized that workers needed housing, and that was maybe a good light bulb to have. Actually, that that all of these people that we'd housed in the housing projects that now were shutting down, well. Kelsapriz, they need some place to live. Where are we going to put them, right? And so there was this whole moment about, oh, I'll put a FEMA trailer next to my restaurant, and I'm really great about this. And look at all this. And so there was this whole. It was great that I think that employers provided that, but I think that I, um, I'm not sure that the connection has stayed to today. And so for that, I think there was sort of an important moment of connecting um, jobs and housing that hadn't happened here before. Um, what, as, as I pu covered public housing. I've covered it for a long time. Um, and those 
people who lived in public housing, um, the, the 3,000 households are, um, have been some of the slowest people to come back. And they were flung the farthest in some cases um, and affected by a lot of policies, including Hanno not taking vouchers back at very key moments and um, FEMA deciding that they weren't going to, that, that you could pay your, your moving expenses up front and then they would reimburse you instead of, instead of paying for moving expenses for people to come back um, as they came. And so those kinds of policies, I think, have slowed the flow of um, low-income people coming back. Um, even last week, I got a call about a woman who's been stuck in Iowa and, and st would like to come home, right? And I think that, that's, I think that it's not uncommon to hear those stories, and I think they're still out there. Um, now, where was I going? Why were you asking me this question? <laughs> Well, I think it's relevant as far as who is not able to come back and, and, who, and who is here. I think I want to start to move in the direction of how we're seeing cultural changes out there, especially the sort of homegrown culture, either by policy or by perhaps new populations moving in. Are you seeing differences in the way that, um, you know, some of our fundamental expressions of New Orleans identity are being played out and how they're received, whether it's brass band culture or, or second lines? And, and how is that fitting into this changing landscape? Um, I mean, I, certainly there are many more people at a second line. They're on, uh, the route sheets are online now. They never used to be. It used to be kind of, you had to find out where it was going. The parade was going. And now you have, can look online and find that, or you can hear it on the radio. It's very much easier to find where a second line is. And the crowd is um, much more white than it used to be, for sure. Um, people are into it, though. They're dancing. I mean, um, as Irvin Maysfeld said uh, recently, like, it, maybe it's not good dancing, but it's dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about the mayor. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I don't know, you know, the, uh, somebody told me a joke not that long ago about um, how can you tell somebody lives in the bywater? Um, or how can you tell you're in the bywater? Out of town license plates, right? Because da 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 da. But um, well, I, I'm. <laughs> I, I think that it's as Allison said. There's there's always a question of who is here, and there's a there's an, always a, um. So it seems a lot of times the question is asked so we can get a good answer as far as a positive answer and the idea of a brain gang. Socially, it seems to me that um, there are certainly a lot more uh, apparatus out there to to assimilate people and to welcome people. I know that. When I got here in 1995, it didn't seem like anybody I cared if I stayed or went. And, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes they really wanted me to go. But, um, but it seems like there is uh, a drive to make sure that there are more people coming here, that we are getting that gain. And I wonder, Allison, you said that you are asked this a lot. When you do have to, when you're forced into a corner to give an answer, I mean, is, has there been this brain gain? And, and, and what are the numbers on it? What are, what are we seeing as far as jobs that are being driven by that? And I think... Um, we might be able to talk, too, about, you know, what neighborhoods this affects. Um, yeah, so I do get asked that question a lot. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, um, I, it's, it's, uh, I happen to mention, um, you know, the folks who lost their jobs at Tulane, um, for example. And the interesting thing is that um, when you do the net on the loss of the educated population who were here pre-Katrina and then factor in who've come since, there's not actually a gain. Um, so the numbers are, um, you know, we have different people here and that that is sort of anecdotally obvious, right? <laughs> the only numbers we actually have on um, who's new that's different. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation did us a pretty widespread survey at the fifth anniversary and found that one out of every 10 people said that they were new post Katrina. Um, so, uh, you know, there does certainly seem to be, you know, some folks who are, who are new, but in terms of brain gain, you know, not, not perhaps so much just because there was loss that we're not necessarily really accounting for. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I talk to folks who do recognize that, right? Like, you know, folks who are, are perhaps better educated or whatever and had their friends leave, right? And, you know, make choices to put their kids in school elsewhere or whatever the choices were. Um, but I think um, the one thing that is really uh, important to 
to recognize and what we what I think we really mean when we talk about brain gain is that um, we have a new phenomena going on um, that is consistent with a growing economy. So when you have a declining economy like we did pre-Katrina, then um, you're not going to have a growing population. Um, you're not going to have sort of people coming and going, accessing different jobs. It's not going to be vibrant that way. Um, which is what you see in New York and San Francisco and other places that have vibrant economies. There's a lot of coming and going, right? Um, and we did not have a lot of coming and going, and it was largely because we had a declining economy. And so now we have a growing economy, and so we're going to have more coming and going. And so uh, there may not actually be a net gain at this point, um, uh, although there may be in the future. Um, but what we do have is a vibrant economy, which means there's going to be a lot more um, shifting in the folks who are here. How does that kind of gain momentum when it comes to affordability? Because I know as, as someone who was recently helping a friend find an apartment, it does seem like housing has, has skyrocketed. And I, how, how, what kind of data do you have on the affordability, both of housing and then, you know, just daily life in New Orleans seems to be much more expensive than it was prior to the storm? Yeah. Um, well, that's a great point. You know, um, I think that when we think about affordability, we have to remember not to um, just focus on this the individual neighborhoods we're most familiar with, right? But try to think a little bit more about the whole city or the whole region. So thinking about the whole city and the whole region, it is a less affordable place, certainly. And so a lot of the, what's driving the housing costs are permanently higher insurance rates. Um, in some cases, uh, permanently, not maybe not permanently, but likely permanently more higher tax rates, property taxes, right? So the, those things all get factored into rents that are charged. And so landlords, we were finding there was a certain point when we were um, in about 2000. Eight, uh, maybe it was 10 or so, um, there was kind of a lot of vacancies in the higher rent apartment buildings and, um, and, and, and individual apartments, um, and landlords were not bringing the rents down um, to sort of pre-Katrina inexpensive rents because they couldn't without losing money because their, their costs of insurance and, and taxes and whatnot were higher. So, so what we're seeing is a permanently more expensive housing stock, and then you get on top of that um, you know, the fluctuations of the market, right? Like we've got this crazy, insane market in Uptown right now. I don't really know what that's about exactly. But that's that's a different factor and that might come and go. Whereas um, because I think, you know, we need to really recognize that we are a coastal city with um, significant risk to um, flooding and, and storm damage, we will have significantly higher housing costs um, on an ongoing basis and that's going to make it very difficult for the many, many people who earn low incomes, particularly in our tourism sector, to um, to have a lifestyle that's uh, that's not always sort of scrambling. Um, so I think housing, the increase in housing housing costs um, post Katrina is a, is I would say a permanent one and is going to be an ongoing challenge. For, and obviously for has communities. impacts on who gets to live here as well and the kind of professions that provide a living to live in, in those conditions as well. Raphael, you, you had pointed us before to the map, and I think that, um, are we seeing now um, that, as you had said, the Latino population prior had always been very spread out, and are we, it seems like we're seeing more of a concentration, perhaps, in places like Jefferson Parish. Are there, are there um, communities growing up there that weren't there before, and, and how are they sort of assimilating into present-day New Orleans? Um, yeah, there... Um so you do have new communities um, that are popping up. Uh, the one that comes to mind immediately is uh, there's a lot of, uh, there was this, um, oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. I completely forget about, I probably actually don't need it, but. <laughs> if you join the LEH, I will buy four more microphones. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you're asking about the assimilation of, of the new folks post-Katrina. Um, yeah, I, has it reached a sort of leveling at this point? I think it has. Uh -huh. I think it has. There has been a leveling. I think there was a peak in the years right after the storm where some folks were here, and a lot of them did decide to settle. If you look at the raw data, the raw numbers, the, the Latino population is not just larger percentage-wise, but in actual count. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much larger. Um, and in, in New Orleans, the, uh, the total population in New Orleans in 2000 was uh, about 14,800 people, and now it's about 18,000. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the eight, uh, 2010 census, and it uh, in Jefferson Parish, I believe in 2000 it was about 36,000, and now it's about 53,000. Yeah. Um, so you've definitely got a larger number. Um, the areas in, uh, in Kenner around the the Williams Boulevard corridor, 
I mean, I've heard some people call that little Honduras because of, the, um, you know, you go up there on that uh, boulevard and you'll see a lot of uh, Latino businesses. A lot of the apartment buildings and houses there are occupied by Hispanics. Uh, West Wego and Avondale, um, uh, there's been a lot of uh, Dominicans, not from the island, but from Northeast, mm -hmm. who got sick and tired of the cold <laughs> and have made their way down here. And it's interesting because um, it's caused an interesting dynamic because our community, um, the Dominican community, was so small before. We all knew each other. And there's a lot of folks that are just new, and <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's a little significant of, of the... Um, you know, of the Hispanic population in general, where you do have folks that were here before and folks that came after, and we're not necessarily connecting. Um, so you, you've got uh, not, I don't want to say two separate communities, but uh, it, it, it's a different phenomenon uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless. And uh, you have seen, um, you know, the numbers uh, grow in Kenner, New Orleans East, and Michoud, uh, the West Bank. You look at the map, you look at uh, Gretna, definitely higher percentage in Mid City, and uh, the Irish Channel. You're, you're seeing place. Uh, you're seeing people settle there. Um, as far as assimilating, I think that's going to take a while before we really see it. Um, I know before the storm, uh, a lot of that took place at the schools. Um, you know, uh, one thing that I noticed, um, you know, at Puentes, we ran um, some volunteering programs. One of the best ones that we had is we got to, um, I mean, countless times, the Saints called us uh, to do some volunteering for them, where we'd hand out materials um, before the game, you know, those giveaways that Copeland's has. And... Um, and we would recruit young students to come with us. You know, we'd bring 30 of them along. And what we noticed is the ones that had um, grown up in Jefferson Parish were usually from uh, the area, had been here before the storm, and they would be excited about it. Um, but we also noticed that the students we'd recruit from Orleans, who were a newer population, we try to, you know, tell them about, you know, come with us, volunteer, we'll go to a free American football game, and they'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> football? It's not oblong, it's round, you kick it, you know? <laughs> But, uh, but so, you know, assimilation, I think, is, it's going to take a while before we really see it because, um, you know, there's just things that you have. To, it's a process, like all immigrant groups have found out. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to open up to questions soon, so I thought that um, maybe as a close, um, we have looked pat backwards and we brought it up to the president. But um, I'll open this up to all three of you to kind of – to maybe look into your crystal ball and say what the impact you think in the next 10 to 20 years of the people that we're seeing now might be, you know, on a cultural level and also I think on an economic level, on a social level. Um, we won't hold you to this and it's not our job to forecast, but I think that um, this is something we all talk about and the motivation for coming is, is what do you think maybe that um, these groups are going to do as far as changing how we understand New Orleans, if at all? Can I ask Rafael a question? Yeah. I mean, are you seeing, um, I don't find New Orleans being really great, official dumb New Orleans great at adapting. Like, um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing enough, uh, like, Spanish-speaking help in schools where you have public school kids in New Orleans because, I, I mean, I remember being in municipal court where the city attorney, no kidding, stood up and said uh, there was a, a Spanish-speaking detainee and um, the city attorney's, uh, the judge said, do we have a translator? And the city attorney said, uh, Your Honor, it's our position that the city speaks English. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you've seen some of those gaps. Yeah. Um, when it comes to language access to ESL programs for students, it is completely terrible here. Um, it, it, there is a gap uh, that is wider than when I was in high school. I went to John Arrett on the West Bank, and um, you know the ESL students, they would go through, and after a year or two, they'd get out of ESL and they'd get put into regular classes. You go into, uh, and remi remember, the majority of the population is in Jefferson Parish. Um, one school that Puentes has done a lot of work at is West Jefferson um, High School, where uh, the, the Latino population, if it's not the majority, it's the plurality. And I mean, the complaints of the ESL program at that school, I mean, it, it, it's, it, they're really bad. The, the students aren't really being taught because the funding's been cut. And uh, I can go into, you know, what the root cause of that is, but that's another topic. Uh, but um, but it's, it's really, um, I mean, the, the gap is really wide. And the, the students that are in ESL aren't being taught adequately. And uh, that's one of our fears. Um, the language access issue has really been at the forefront of what we've been trying to do um, to the point where Puentes and, and a lot of uh, stakeholders in the community founded the Language Access Coalition 
in order to advocate for that, um, you know, at the, at the municipal level and even at the state level. Yeah. Allison, do you think that we're looking at a long-term rise? I know that there's been some work um, recently about, um, you know, we're looking at another petroleum boom. Um, obviously, tech industries continue to grow, we think. The movie industry, do you see this, this increase in population continuing? Um, yeah, so um, there's, you know, in the New Orleans Index at 8, um, which you guys got the executive summary, um, the really fascinating thing about our economy is that um, there definitely was stimulus because of Katrina, but now there's an entirely new thing about to happen, and that is this amazingly large boom in petrochemical um, expansion between here and Baton Rouge. And it's, um, it's almost like uh, another mini... Not even mini, maybe half-sized uh, oil boom, um, and uh, you know, and, and they're freaking out about how they're going to get enough people to build all the plants that that that, that have been um, committed to be built between here and Baton Rouge, and also then staff them. Um, and that all has to do with low gas prices, low natural gas prices that happen to be how we build our infrastructure to fuel those plants. Blah blah blah. Without getting into all the details, it's very real, and a lot of people don't know about it. Um, pe petrochemicals are what? Everything from Dow all the way up in, in Baton Rouge to the refineries down all the way through, like, this area. No, so it's just, it's it's everything, like, it's not some new, in, it's not no. something, no. it's just that why why is it expanding here in such a big way? So it has to do with low gas, low natural gas prices. Here's the thing that's sort of a twist, and I hope there's not a quiz on this because I'm not sure I could pass it, but low, because the no, low natural gas prices, which are predicted to be, like for a long, 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 long time because we have huge shales. They're going to be permanently low, and our whole industry is um, f literally fueled by those uh, the, by natural gas. And because it's so cheap, the industries are saying um, that they're willing to invest. So there's going to be a ton of jobs. Um, and then there will be a lot of BP money flowing to, um, to rebuild the wetlands. Hopefully. Hopefully, right? <laughs> 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 so, um, 50 /50? right. So anyway, but the, but that means that, that our economy has a lift that it hasn't had in decades, um, and will continue to attract people, but hopefully will employ more people locally. I feel like we're all ready for some more questions from yeah. you all. Um, before we do that, can we give these three a big round of applause? <laughs> <laughs>